Hello and happy Tuesday, my friends. This is Amy Lee San Juan, and it is always a pleasure to welcome you back to another episode of Cisco Champion Radio, where we discuss topics across the Cisco portfolio to give you the insights you want and hopefully need. Before we get into it, just a couple of announcements. The IT Blog Awards is now open to community voting. Please, if you haven't yet, check out the finalists and vote for your favorites. And secondly, we are now accepting Cisco Champion 2022 applications. So if you're interested in becoming a part of this amazing group of technologists and even potentially host your own Cisco Champion Radio episode, among other fun things, please apply. You will find the links in the show notes below. All right, back to our regular programming. Today, my friends, we are talking about hybrid work. And what I've come to understand is this is way more than simply having the ability to work from anywhere. It is a cultural and organizational transformation, and it requires your infrastructure, security, and experience to be seamless, strong, and capable. So join us for the next half hour or so as our champions and Cisco experts talk about the future of work and solutions such as secure access, full stack observability, and hybrid cloud. Okay, let's get to know our Cisco experts and champion hosts. Fabio and Andre, we'll start with you. Can you tell us more about who you are and what you do at Cisco? Absolutely. Thank you for having us, uh, Amelie. Uh, this is Fabio Gori. I'm Vice President of uh, Customer Solutions Marketing here in the Cisco Engineering Organization. It's nice to have you, Andre. Hi, I'm Andre Laurent. My focus is on making sure everybody can rest well once their head hits the pillow. But, but in all reality, uh, it's, it's all about uh, interoperability and quality at Cisco, and therefore I lead a framework uh, that's focused on ensuring that we can deliver on those commitments. So that's called Cisco Validated. Very nice. All right, now on to our host, Diera. Who are you? What do you do? Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm Diera Footman. I'm a network engineer and content creator over at my blog, CCIE by 30. And you can follow me across social media at CCIE by 30. Amazing. Michael, you are up next. Yes, Mike Witte. Um, I'm a principal architect at Worley Technology. Um, I'm really focused on, you know, data center networking, full stack, uh, full stack observability, that's a mouthful, um, and pretty much stitching multiple domains uh, together, such as SD-WAN access and data center and cloud, obviously. Is that all you do, Michael? <laughs> no, <laughs> a couple more. <laughs> <laughs> Write blogs, do a lot of things, yeah. <laughs> That's a long list. All right, Shai, last but not least, my friend. Thank you, Emily. Great to be here and great to do a first recording of the year for 2022 here. Exciting. Uh, my name is Shai Silverman. I'm the Director of Network Services at San Jose State University. Uh, and uh, one of my jobs is kind of like a, a therapist for technology. I help technology with people problems. Very nice. Okay, Fabio. Before the champs kick off the discussion, uh, can you provide some background on where we've been and what we're seeing today around hybrid work? Absolutely. And uh, of course, this is one of the biggest uh, uh, problems that we've um, we ever seen, of course, uh, not just in our lives, but uh, just by taking the, the IT slice, if you want. I think it's fair to say that for many, many years, uh, probably 10, 12 years, uh, we've seen the rise of, um, of the cloud. And um, this has changed a lot in the IT organization with the introduction of new practices like DevOps. Now, what happened at the at the beginning of um, of 2020 uh, is kind of a symmetrical revolution. Uh, this time happening at the access level. In fact, what we saw is that, of course, IT organization discovered that most of their disaster recoveries, uh, disaster recovery plans, were fundamentally worthless because everybody thought about how to make data center redundant or applications redundant and nobody thought ever before that the actual problem was going to be at the workforce level uh, being incapacitated to come of course to offices and to campuses and so all of a sudden being stranded at home in some form of uh, of a remote uh, remote work by the way um, either uh, because of technology limitations or even in some cases for uh, regulation some people were completely incapacitated uh, to make their work um, because because of regulation. Think about, of course, uh, you know the health sector, the financial sector, and other sectors that are you know regulated from from this standpoint. So uh, clearly, everybody scrambled um, to uh, build resiliency plans, and some businesses uh, actually didn't even make it through the transition. Right? Some businesses literally 
really kind of stop completely. Now, what happened uh, since then, if you think about it, is this incredible access uh, revolution, whereby uh, due to the, um, if you want, inability uh, to kind of forecast what, what, what is, is going to happen next month, um, IT organizations are now forced to kind of um, design for completely different criteria than what they used to. In particular, you don't really know where workers are going to be working the next day. Um, and this is really giving the rise to a completely new model, uh, which is hybrid work. And it's not just dictated by, of course, the evolution of the pandemic, but it's dictated by a change of, uh, of, of the cultural approach that we're all having in this hybrid, new hybrid, uh, hybrid work uh, environment, whereby people are now discovering that uh, what they want is freedom is freedom to, uh, whenever possible, decide whether they're going to go to the office or stay at home. Sometimes we're still stuck at home without ability to decide. But moving forward, I think we all kind of understand that there will be a chance to, to do so. Um, and uh, if you look at some of the data that we gather in our um, hybrid work uh, index, you can just uh, you know, uh, search for it on the internet. It's pretty easy to reach. 64% of people we interviewed uh, are now saying that the ability of deciding where to work um, is a key criteria uh, to decide whether staying in, in your current um, em employment employer or, or or actually changing. So this is uh, this is really an enormous uh, an enormous change. And from an IT standpoint, um, if you think uh, now about this access revolution. And on the other side, having um, the cloud revolution still ongoing, well, in the middle, fundamentally, you have a secure network that needs to be <laughs> fundamentally redesigned. Uh, you have enormous uh, uh, new security challenges uh, because, of course, you got to have the same level of security wherever you are. And at the end of the day, what everybody uh, ultimately strive for is to provide a great application and and you know, um, great customer, partner, or employee experience. And guaranteeing that in this new incredibly distributed environment is exceptionally challenging. So I would say is is a 360 degree issue for the IT organization that's likely going to uh, generate very, very different architectures of what we're seeing, of, the, of what we, compared to what we've seen in the past, as well as a very, very different cultural approach to how to handle um, uh, the design of this kind of architectures and the operating models of them. Uh, thank you, Fabio. I, I, uh, uh, very, very well put. Uh, I, I really uh, kind of think that we, we even have like the, the problem today, at least in the Bay Area, statistically they're talking that uh, a lot of the large companies in the Bay Area are expected to lose 30% of the workforce because people are simply not wanting to uh, to live in the Bay Area, which is highly dense, and they want to work remote. So we have a whole cultural shift of what work really is and means. And and with the hybrid work, it's it's really about, like you said, the, the freedom. And, and I think it elaborates uh, really work from anywhere. It's not just about being standard at home, but really being having the freedom to work, whether it's from, you know, from from Starbucks, uh, you know, from the park, uh, from the, you know, from from the backyard. Uh, but it it uh, it also changes the focus of how we work and the tools that we have to use and the services we consume. Uh, I think, for example, uh, I mean, we take for granted the ability to go into uh, into a conference room, and now it's all dependent on video streaming. It depends on collaboration tools. Uh, it's just also a huge shift in in how we interact with each other, um, and not just the technology that we that we use, like the applications. Uh, what do you think is like the biggest challenge uh, that companies are, are facing with this transition uh, that that they haven't been able to be so adaptable to? Well, let me take that one. Well, let me take it, Fabio, at a first stab. I mean, the thing that I hear uh, most uh, from customers in terms of complaints, in terms of not being able to make the uh, to adapt, is like the lack of adaptability. They've, they've, they're they're set, and then uh, their workers. Different types of workers now that have to work remote where they didn't work remote before are creating uh, different types of demands on IT. And uh, those operational models that Fabio was discussing, are they're not in place. And then there's a scale issue that has to be considered. So whenever we think about design to be able to address like changes in uh, architecture uh, and, and different business priorities, there's a scale factor associated with that. And I'm, I'm sure 
maybe one of you guys have an example of that within your own environment where, you know, you've had all of a sudden a demand to be able to accommodate some business need based on the pandemic or some other circumstance where different types of workers are now uh, having to work uh, remotely and, you know, the technology and the connectivity that you were using before w wasn't able to accommodate. I mean, does do one of you guys have an example like that? Sure. I mean, even just like moving call centers. I mean, I mean, a simple office job and now people have to work from home and, and run a call center. Uh, I think also a good demonstration also was the, I mean, the huge increase in WebEx traffic overnight. I mean, as far as scaling out. Yeah, I think Deidre had a good one too, right? Yeah. Um. So at my previous organization, we pretty much approached remote work before the pandemic with a a VDI solution. So we had invested very heavily in a lot of SaaS products. So it wasn't really that necessary for you to, you know, be on the network if you were outside of, you know, IT and a couple of other like core teams. So when we, you know, went remote, obviously we're putting a lot of stress on this VDI system. And then, you know, here comes users that we thought, you know, didn't have any need to be on the network who are like, hey, I need to be able to access my files that are on a share that's somewhere sitting, you know, on a Synology under my desk. So we had to, you know, really act quickly in one scaling capacity, kind of putting a Band-Aid on our system and, and extending VDI out to these other users. And then we had to look for a long-term solution, which pretty much meant like a traditional VPN solution. Yeah, I mean, I'm hearing a lot of those kinds of examples and uh, and then just the echoing in the hallway of this similar types of things we always hear about in terms of uh, considerations uh, in terms of which solution to go toward forward with, which, when it's, whether it's ease of configuration or having the right monitoring and troubleshooting capabilities, adaptability, as Fabio mentioned before, flexibility is something completely different than adaptability. In my opinion, it's the granularity by which we can uh, tweak an implementation. So those are those things are still very prevalent and um uh, but I th I like what Fabio was saying in terms of the you know the focus on resiliency going beyond the applications and uh, where the workloads are sitting and and thinking about the workforce. Yeah, and 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 that's one thing we've we've seen. I mean, we we have a visibility into into hundreds of customers, right, and across all different OEMs. So everybody has had to spin up, you know, these these DR scenarios, like you said for their users, right? We've never really thought about that, right? We have DR for applications, DR for storage. Um, you know, if you if you get, you know, ransomware or something like that, we never thought about DR for our for our users, right? So um every, everybody's done a pretty good job at pivoting. Um, but there's been some challenges from an architecture standpoint, right? Uh we are seeing a lot of security issues because now you have all these remote users, they they're coming into either, you know, a head endpoint. Um, so, you know, like Deirdre said, they had to scale up their VDI solution. We're seeing that from a network standpoint. So, you know, what are you guys seeing out there from an architecture standpoint that customers really need to start looking at, right? Um, as they start planning their infrastructure for the next, say, three to five years. Because again, I don't feel that the workforce is going to come back all on campus again. I think I think we've made a dramatic shift in work life balance, and now people are going to be working a lot from home. So, so what do you guys say? But by the way, Michael, just to quantify what you just said, um, and again, quoting our hybrid work index uh, and data coming from our own platforms, in this case, uh, Cisco Umbrella. Um, while we saw a big jump of um, remote access usage, needless to say, uh, when the pandemic started, we saw actually a much bigger jump in uh, malicious attacks, attempts on remote access infrastructure, 2.4 times bigger mm -hmm. than what we saw before the pandemic. That tells you the kind of unbelievable scale of the challenge. Criminals uh, seems to be always ahead of the, uh, the game, <laughs> unfortunately. And so, yes, you're right. Architecturally, uh, things have to have to change quite quite dramatically. And then Fabio, there is also that we we're constantly hearing about uh, customers challenged with now having new forms of connectivity, not always controlling all of the pathways, and trying to get greater visibility. I think full stack observability is something that I can't I can't get into any conversation with anyone in IT these days without uh, you know having a discussion around that. Uh, what are you hearing, Fabio, on that one? 
Well, <clears throat> it's 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 pretty it's pretty straightforward that we're seeing um, two two effects, right? The first one is we know that with cloud native technologies, monolithic uh, apps um, have been on on the way to being highly distributed. Um, lots of microservices, uh, very often in multiple clouds. Um, you use uh, third party modules um, very often, like. Many developers don't have a payment uh, or a security uh, service. Um, they just use an external one, right? So this in itself is highly, highly distributed. And then on top of that, um, just consider that your users can be anywhere. So all of a sudden, you have an incredible distribution, not just of your application, but of the users to your application. And so fundamentally, you have a, a huge issue into kind of making sure that when you have a problem, you'll be able to understand where the problem is. It could be anything. It could be like a timer in, uh, in the execution of one of these this runtimes. It could be uh, a network jitter. Uh, it could be um, uh, you know, uh, an external DNS service uh, that you're using that all of a sudden goes down. We've seen some of these <laughs> issues lately without yeah. mentioning names. Yeah. Um, and so it makes, incre I think, uh, the need for visibility and over time, more and more full stack observability becomes just a table stake. Because um, otherwise the problem is uh, the IT will end up into some pretty uh, bad finger pointing, right? Uh, that's why I think also the need of correlating information across various teams, uh, SecOps, yeah. NetOps, uh, and application operations becomes incredibly important. Um, you can call it mean time to innocence, <laughs> um, depending on the angle that you're, that you're, that you're looking at, but uh, this becomes really a huge, huge uh, challenge. Yeah, it's really, it's really about application experience, right? Because, um, you know, in, in the past, uh, remote users have kind of looked as almost like second-class citizens, right? Um, and you, they really never got the, the attention, right, of, of having a great user experience, right? And now that your workforce is so distributed, it's it's super important to give those people um, the, the quality and, and application experience that that they uh, you know that they actually need to to do their jobs right. So, um, you know, w where's Cisco going? You know, in their portfolio from trying to to get this end to end visibility. I wanted to add to, to to your question, Michael. Here too yeah. is because it, uh, it, it's almost like like a whole paradigm shift in how we design and architect. And we used to have you know let's start designing. Uh, I'll, I'll use the OSI model, right? You know, from infrastructure, you know, like layer one, layer two to the application. Now we have redefined the OSI from seven layer to the ten layer model, where it starts yeah. with the people. So yeah. we're now looking at the people, and it's almost that we 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 have to now not really differentiate the level of service between our s staff, employees, and customers. They all need the same uh, the same level of service almost. Going back to your question, Michael, just to, to mention a couple of uh, like Cisco-specific examples. Um, one, the, the area that we're working on uh, in full stack observability, of course, we, are, we have three major platforms uh, that are forming, uh, you know, our our proposition there. The first one is, of course, uh, app dynamics, uh, with the monitoring of the the application itself. Um, we have Cisco Intersight uh, that monitors the cloud infrastructure in this hybrid environment, right? And then um, uh, we think our ultimate differentiator is having thousand eyes that extends the visibility across the network, uh, and that means networks that you control and networks that you don't control. Uh, such as uh, the internet and, and internet service providers. Now, one of the things that we're doing is uh, correlating the uh, data and streaming data in real time across these platforms. Um, without going too complicated, uh, one of the biggest um, benefits that you get is, for instance, when you look at the user of, uh, of, of AppDynamics, application operation, they'll be able to see when they have thousand eyes as well, the correlation between the application performance and the network performance. And that will solve uh, very, very quickly the issue of understanding whether it's an application problem or network problem, something that may take days, if not weeks, in, in some cases, just, just to figure out. Uh, Fabio, you also get that with um, with Nexus Dashboard too, right? So that's that's another one of exactly. your products, right? That's that's doing that that integration, right? So, you know, with Thousand Eyes, you get that visibility from a WAN, a WAN lens perspective, right? But then 
dashboard actually gives you that visibility into the actual data center, right, where you're hosting traffic right from. So you really you really get the end-to-end -end view, quite honestly. And and just to finish on this one, and then we can we can move forward if you want. But uh, I think uh, what we're seeing is we're moving from, um, if you want, uh, lagging indicators in terms. Okay, this happened. Let's see what is going on. But the road ahead is predictive kind of indicators, right? So when Nexus, you just mentioned Nexus dashboard, then one of the most intriguing fig features of Nexus dashboard is pre-change verification, where you can start pushing. Um, you know, the new configuration to the evaluation engine. And, and that will tell you whether any critical issue will derive from the change that you're about to do before you actually do it. And if you do, you better go back and uh, evaluate evaluate what's actually going on. So I think uh, this uh, road to predictive is, uh, is the ultimate direction where we're heading to. And it's a really kind of also the adoption of, of the AI ops and, and DevOps, right? Because, I mean, the ability to pre-test means that we're now able to do the CI, CD, continuous integration and, and delivery models uh, and automated testing. Yeah, in many cases, we're taking advantage of APIs to do the integrations. And so if you go even down one layer into capabilities, I mean, you have things like the ability to embed uh, widgets into dashboards between apps. You have the ability to natively ingest KPIs from one application into the other. Uh, it's all intended to help to facilitate, you know, uh, day two operations and being able to get to that mean time to innocence type thing that Fabio was discussing. But also, you want to automate based on that information. And so if there's an alert, maybe you uh, impact the policy based on that. So I think what you can expect from Cisco is that we're gonna to continue to uh, make great progress in this area. Right? And it's gonna be 100% focused on uh, customer use cases. And when I say customer, I'm talking about all of the personas. I'm talking about in ways that enable the, the business stakeholders within your organization, but also enable and empower you guys as IT to be able to you know make your life easier and uh, more predictable in terms of you know, the outcomes that you're delivering on behalf of the org. Yeah, yeah, yeah. speaking of that, I mean, because it seems that, you know, it's easy to kind of show and, and and understand the change in roles we've had. We're moving to the cloud, DevOps, SRE kind of methodology. Uh, but my, um, I, I think, uh, let's talk about executive level. I mean, I think there's also been a change of roles and expectations from uh, at executive level of IT organizations. Uh, any Any thoughts on that? I see the I in the CIO uh, really changing. This has been discussed before. Uh, this is nothing new, but maybe it's becoming more prevalent. And that is that you know we typically think of CIO as the information officer, um, but I really believe it's now the role is more and more uh, expected that it's an innovation officer. And it's it's not just about achieving those IT benefits of you know reducing cost and complexity and lowering risk. Those are absolutely front and center, very critical. But it's trying to find ways to transform IT operations, uh, operationalize across the entire IT estate, now inclusive of cloud, and do it in a way where it helps the business innovate faster. And innovating faster means some of those outcomes that we talk about and we are focused on are very far from IT. It could be that I want to accommodate testing uh, for or, or vaccinating more, more patients uh, in a hospital environment. It could mean that I want to accelerate onboarding of new students now that I don't have the facilities maybe in place to do it and I need to use other other capabilities to be able to deliver on that. So it's more business-centric uh, focused. But it doesn't mean IT uh, operations is not important, right? It, it's just that it it all links back to how are we in a, helping the organization innovate faster. But by the way, this is something that I'd like to hear from, from the rest of the uh, the panel here, but I'm going to be the stat man again. Um, one of the things that we're seeing from our WebEx platform is that since the um, you know we moved to this new uh, hybrid work model and very often being mostly remote, 47%, 47% of people on average in meetings are not speaking. So whether you're in IT or not, this is one of the biggest management challenges of all times. In that you have half of your half of your um, team that normally doesn't speak in your calls, so it's it's an enormous issue of inclusivity of people that you know risk to be stranded uh, when when remote and uh, unable um, to collaborate. So this is this is a ginormous problem. There are there are things that we started doing 
of course, uh, uh, within the WebEx team outside of just uh, uh, collaboration sessions, for instance, uh, by enabling people to express themselves with gestures. And once again, you know, AI capabilities allow you to see whether people agree or disagree and kind of quote unquote reading body language, right? At least, uh, at least uh, you know, we're starting doing that. But I think uh, from a management standpoint, it is an unbelievable um, issue. Uh, managing people that are uh, teams that are so distributed. So IT needs to take the charge and see if uh, technology can help. Yeah, I, th I think what, yeah, I think what I'm, what, I'm, what we are seeing is also that um, a lot of our customers are struggling with skill sets. Okay. So, you know, we have this, this concept of the great uh, resignation, right? So a lot of people are leaving either for more money or potentially because they don't want to go into the office because they are afraid of COVID or because they found a place that they can work remote or maybe just change their career completely. But um, there's definitely more work to do with less people. Um, and then, you know, there's a skill sets, right? So, you know, we're seeing, you know, automation. Um, I've actually, full stack observability has really take it off so you know data scientists all, all types of things like that um, you know have really come to um, you know the forefront of, of needing that type of of, uh, of skill set so you know where you guys you know for people that are coming up in the ranks right and just getting started in IT um, or, or been in IT for a few years you know and they're struggling a little where, where do you think that they should really focus their their efforts? Right, so they can support um, their IT organizations. I think the number one thing is uh, first in a mindset, uh, and 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 what I mean by that is uh, go back to the CIO priority and the C the new CIO role, chief innovation officer. How are you helping your CIO to innovate on behalf of the business? It's a mindset thing, and that means that more than ever the importance needs to be placed on you know balancing the uh, skill uh, with things like architecture learning about architecture and the fundamentals of architecture and what does it mean when we say people process technology and how do those things have an impact on driving the business priorities and introducing new capabilities into the business and then design is another one and i've i mean look my my twitter handles you know ask accde i mean i'm big into design and i love design and i think everything comes back to design so um, but we, we have new design considerations that we didn't have before, and there are new capabilities that are uh, helping to enable new things. And so design is, is very important. Uh, Fabio, did you have any other ones that you're seeing? Um, so to, to kind of spin off that design part, um, what I've seen a lot of is the need to quickly spin up um, resources and access to the network like on the fly, I'm talking, hey, we get a call in the morning, the ED's overloaded, we need to um, spin up tents for additional testing or COVID patients. What solutions or um, improvements are, is Cisco providing to help engineers kind of be uh, agile on the fly with spinning these solutions up while also being secure? I'd say there are two things uh, in that area because this comes back to connectivity and secure connectivity. And in that case, it's uh, maybe more than one person that's connecting remote. It's uh, because that's treated as a temporary facility uh, from what I'm understanding when you say tent or it's trailer or these kinds of things. And so most of the time, and there's discussions I see on some, sometimes on LinkedIn and Twitter and other, other places around like automation. Is it a skill that you learn or should it be embedded in the offering? And, and what I'm seeing with Cisco um, in terms of what we what we have available in terms of our go to market as well as what we're working on is creating greater auto, greater automation capabilities in the solution itself. So when you think about it, like zero touch provisioning of facilities, uh, onboarding of new devices, and doing it in a secure way, and that comes back to the integrations that we have. Um, so whether it's vManage and, and SD WAN, or whether it's a Meraki type deployment, uh, we hear things like zero touch zero touch provisioning. To me, comes to mind when when you mention that. Uh, yeah, GTP, and um, and then the other thing that I and it, that I that I'm seeing is that um, APIs like go to DevNet, dig in, right? There there are people that are uh, people that are getting very skilled in leveraging different types of third party tools that are 100% centered around uh, simplifying the automation of different types of tasks, and so you know we take 
we're committed to APIs. That's part of an interoperability, our journey in terms of providing greater interoperability. Yeah, and I can make a, I can make a couple of uh, examples there. For instance, so if you look at our trusted access architecture, uh, if you look at what we've done with the introduction and the new release of um, ICE, the Cisco Identity Service Engine, now you can literally program the onboarding of enormous amount of uh, you know objects and devices and the likes, for instance, to build new entire new sites. Uh, you know, we had this issue expanding, for instance, uh, health facilities, hospitals, and the likes. You, you can you can literally get them uh, stood up with uh, with your Ansible or Terraform um, scripts uh, without necessarily uh, going um, you know one by one and having a very disciplined approach to establishing policies uh, for your IoT domains for your uh, of course uh, uh, IT domains that you need to control. So going back to your uh, even a couple of questions ago, if you want, Michael. When you said, uh, you know, where do the young generation need to look at? I think it's programmability. Uh, Andre mentioned that with APIs. I, I am a firm believer that the DevOps concept will extend to the uh, all the domains of the AT organization. And so being able to program uh, the infrastructure to me becomes the number one uh, thing. And to that extent, I think we... We can't afford to have um, IT experts that only understand their area, much like uh, what we saw in data center, where you know we used to have networking experts, storage experts, and computing experts, and now pretty much everybody is a full stack expert. I think we're about to see the same kind of trend uh, all across the board, whereby networking people understand security issues and, and application experience uh, and monitoring uh, problems. Um, so for me, that's, that's where, you know, really the skills that need to be taken, uh, more and more automation programmability and, and cross domain knowledge. Part of that too, though, is you have to, the, the company has to also offer that, um, as well to the employees too, right? So a lot of times an employee may want to, you know, expand their horizons and learn VMware or learn about SASE and things like that. But, you know, they're, they're kind of put in a silo and they say, nope, all you're going to do is, you know, Nexus stuff. So I think, you know, not only do um, engineers have to be um, a little more flexible, right? I think companies also have to do that too as well and, and allow their, um, you know, their their employees to do stuff like that. Also to that point, like I've just seen companies who've been slow to innovate, slow to kind of adopt things like the cloud and also like automation. They're just trying to hold off as much as they can. And I think we're getting to a point where it's like you're just you're going to make things very painful for your staff if you're not kind of looking forward and adopting these these new skill sets and and training your staff. Sometimes in a way that you can overcome some of those challenges is uh, we oftentimes, this is, a, this is kind of a cultural thing, but it depends on your organization, but we oftentimes ask for permission before we roll our sleeves up. And sometimes what we can get is a little bit of room. Like it doesn't have to be perfect, right? But we can get a little bit of room to start doing some level of innovation and incubation, like as a pilot. You start labeling something as a pilot. And, you know, I'm going to deliver a recommendation or maybe a few different recommendations based on this pilot, or we're going to learn something. And it's not asking for a lot of investment to get started. It's asking for a minimal amount of invest investment to get started. And then you're going to produce some kind of result and then you're going to tie it back to the business. So if we take that architecture approach and we start uh, thinking through different design considerations and we start leveraging programmability as part of our pilot and we start leveraging those skills and we join communities where we can learn. So we're not waiting for somebody to fund our learning. Uh, and we just take that as a, we're on a journey to learn for the rest of our lives. I think we can address some of this and uh, it's a, it's again a journey. It won't be perfect, but it, it is a journey, right? Because I mean, if you think about it now, all the home networks became almost uh, by default part of the corporate networks. Uh, and, uh, I, I'm actually curious if you have any statistics, for example, on, on the growth rate of traffic volume uh, versus from large sites to small sites. We actually do. Here is the, your stat man again. Um, we, we just published uh, the, the new release of the Hybrid Work Index, and uh, it is pretty staggering when you look at this data, because um, of course we had, um, and we look at the, the traffic generated out of the um, entire Meraki platform in this case, 
And uh, of course, you see, I mean, we, we, we're in audio year, but so try to follow my imagination. But from the baseline of 2019, um, when the pandemic, of course, started, we saw a pretty, pretty deep drop in terms of the traffic generated pretty much across the board. But since the, uh, pretty much the, um, that, that, uh, uh, that negative peak, we've seen the traffic uh, growing up relentlessly. And you'll be amazed to know, that, to hear that uh, small sites are growing almost three times faster than, than medium and large sites in terms of traffic. Now, don't misunderstand me, large sites are still growing and they are now around 10% higher in terms of the volume of traffic generated since the beginning of the pandemic. But small and medium sites are 30% uh, bigger than that. Uh, so they're growing uh, at unbelievable place, uh, pace, uh, signaling a couple of things. First, there's an, the emergence of video as just the dominant component of this traffic. Um, and, and clearly that's understandable. But it's also clearly signaling a preference of um, uh, uh, employees to actually um, you know, work from smaller sites than very, very large sites. So it's early to call. But we may be, again, talk, going back to my initial point that we, we are seeing an access revolution. We may be seeing at the beginning of something that is, is very long-ranging in terms of reassessing what is the real estate footprint of our companies, right? Should you go closer to where your employees uh, uh, live, right? Of course, you're, you're never going to be like super pervasive, but um, this is something that it's it's pretty incredible to think and think about IT organizations that literally have no way to plan and they need to be adaptable for any kind of outcome. That's why, you know, I think the access is, is almost as exciting as the cloud uh, recently, believe it or not, because there is an unbelievable challenge that needs to be solved moving forward. Yeah, but I mean, talking about access and secure access, I mean, how do we extend the i'm going to call it the the big corporate security that we've been used to uh into the smaller and home sites no that's a question that then i would say Shai, it's 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 through the integrations and it's through you know a cloud native right so and that those are the things that we're seeing i mean uh, and we have to consider scale obviously and you have to configure the um distribution distributed environments that we're dealing with today and if we it, it, well, everything comes back to visibility because if we don't baseline first in terms of understanding where we're at and, and uh, with the traffic patterns and how users are accessing where they're accessing from if we don't have if we can't turn on the lights like we've never turned on the lights before we're blind um, yeah. so and, and that's I, where I, the observability comes from yes i and i really i strongly believe like that's so important to making design decisions and, and uh and then enabling to, uh, you know, expanding secure connectivity and then, you know, actioning on the, the insights that we, we gain and gather from the visibility. Uh, for me, and I'm curious to hear what, what DR and Michael think about it, but for me, it, it's, it's at this point is imperative to have a clear strategy to deploy a very secure software defined when, right? That takes advantage of. Uh, the cloud takes advantage of, uh, you know, software capabilities um, distributed across the entire the entire network um, infrastructure. But uh, it's a, you know it's a, it's a grand redesign of the secure network of the um, of of every every company. And you're right, the home is the new branch. That's another big challenge. So the, we are at the intersection of uh, a number of trends where. You need to guarantee application performance, but you also need to guarantee the security of people in a domain that normally wasn't part of the IT um, organization, right? Beyond, you know, some antivirus on your computer. Uh, and that's a big challenge. So I'm curious to hear what you guys think about this, this new secure software defined when, uh, what are you seeing out there? I think for me, I've been seeing um, a lot of focus on the endpoint itself. So making sure that the user's, you know, laptop is up to specs and a lot of push towards implementing posturing through ICE, uh, making sure that, you know, you have all your patches, you have all your updates before you even connect to the network. Um, and that's that's where I've seen a lot of like hyper focus on from the security teams I've been working with. Uh, Michael, I'm curious to hear your point yeah, I mean, I mean, I would, I would completely agree with that. We're also seeing, um, I, I would say, almost every one of our customers are looking at 
um, the hybrid cloud model, right? And and landing some kind of a SASE solution um, in a colo, right? That's gotten super popular, right? Um, because most of these colos are located within a couple of milliseconds from all of the public cloud providers, right? So you have this, this SASE model where th that user just lands in a colo, he's got two milliseconds to, you know, Outlook 365 and Salesforce and, and things like that. But then we can pipe them back from there into our network for legacy applications and things like that. But yeah, security on the endpoint, it's, it's very, very hard to do any kind of segmentation at scale, especially when you have such a distributed workforce. It, ha it has to be endpoint. Completely agree with that. I have kind of an interesting question. It's like, it seems that when we started like the whole transition with COVID, uh, a lot of businesses really moved to their business resumption and, and DR plan. And that's how we've been operating for the last uh, two years. Uh, what are the now implications, uh, I think, for uh, a lot of companies in the hybrid workforce uh, with regards to disaster recovery and business resumption? I think nowadays, uh, well, we just came off of SASE, right? So, you know, when I'm thinking of like services and inspection engines, you know, ideally most of those now are delivered by, the, you know, from these nearby uh, POPs. And then you have like what uh, Michael was talking about, you know, the convergence of SD-WAN, security, zero trust, middle mile optimization, all happening as part of like consolidated services. I think because the solution offering and what what is being delivered as part of that solution in terms of capabilities is, is changing, um, that that overall strategy in terms of DR is also going to change. So I'm... Um, it's a hard question to answer. It's like one of those kind of, it depends and depends on where the customer is in their journey. Um, you will, we will always have to think about uh, business continuity, right? And we will have to think about you know, these new considerations around like workforce now that we weren't thinking about before. We thought we were okay just because the apps were, uh, you know, that we had a backup strategy for being able to provide the applications, but from where, <laughs> you know, and, and that's it, it's different now. <laughs> Yeah, but ha having a good DRBR plan, it's uh, it's kind of like having a very soft pillow, as as we kind of say. Yeah, it goes back to that pillow. I want to be able to put my head on the pillow and rest well. You know, it's like I, I mean, the, all of us in IT are always thinking about how how we sleep well, right? It's like the the last thing I want is to be called in the middle of the night saying, "Oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, there, you know, we were attacked. There's an outage, you know, um, you, you know, and in some cases, if it's healthcare, it could be patients' lives are at stake. So it's it's scary. Um, so, so well, I got a good question too. It is so. So, what do you guys think has happened positively, right, from from all of this, right? Because, you know, I, I see a couple things, right. I see I see a lot of people with with a better home life work balance. Quite honestly, you know, um, you know, if if your kids are home sick and you're working from home, then you don't have to take a day off from work, right? You can you can deal with that. Um, we're also seeing a lot of companies um, offering a lot more flexible hours, right? Where they say, you know, we know that you have to do, you have to help your kids during, you know, school hours and you can kind of do your job, you know, after, after dinner and things like that. Um, and also, I think this is really important is that by offering more remote work, you're, you're getting a bigger pool set of, of, uh, of talent, Right. Because if you're forcing people to go into an office, right, you're only going to draw from that metro area. Right. People are only going to drive so far. Right. You offer remote. Right. Then then you your your talent pool grows exponentially. Right. So you have way more people that you could choose from, um, you know, that you can get, you know, higher and, you know, much, much better talent. Hey Michael, that this is a this is such a good question. Uh, you, you really made me think intensely, and uh, I think uh, I think the best thing that I mean we're still very close, right, to this enormous change that just happened. So it's early to call, but I think the realization that it's about empowering people is the biggest one. It's almost like we're putting people back into the center. You know, it's easy to say people process and tools and and look at disaster recovery. And just to quote what you were saying a second ago, we only kind of build uh, disaster recovery plans for uh, for tools. Interestingly enough, right? Uh, pretty much. But the realization that people really will lead where we go next, and it's uh, it, there's going to be a new work for talent, which has already started. Uh, 
Um, I think that's the biggest thing. Now, from an IT standpoint, um, I think this is the ultimate test for IT and for IT organizations because IT now are even more vital to build and run entire businesses. I think most boards have realized that without IT contribution and IT stepping up, uh, you're not going to make it um, because you need true business resiliency and, and moving forward, you need true adaptability because you just don't know what you don't know. There's a, there's a realization there are many more um, unknown variables I had for businesses than what probably there's, there's ever been. And so I think uh, those, those are the two. And so if you are an IT, it's a great time to be in IT and really stepping up to the challenge. Yeah, I, I think I think um, companies have started to trust their employees because that was really the big the big drawback uh, of remote work that you know the guy is going to be out playing tennis and stuff like that during the day. But I think that you know after two years, two plus years, you know of of being away from the office and it's business as usual, if not getting even more out of people. Quite honestly, I think I think as you know, as a world economy, we've come together and said, "Hey, you know, everybody's working remote and it's business as usual." So, you know, maybe we should really look at this remote work thing as a good thing. Quite honestly, for our employees and for the business. Also, budgets. Uh, in some cases, in some cases, budgets are uh, budgets are expanding. They're changing, right? Yeah, like yeah, the but. Like if real estate is not as critical and certain buildings are being shut down and then funds are becoming available to actually invest in infrastructure where as long as the business case can be made. And so we're seeing a lot more um, a lot more customers wanting to modernize and they're wanting to modernize infrastructure because they want to secure and they want the visibility. And then be, based on that, then it become, then it gets into things like, okay, I have the visibility and now I can get, gather insight and then I have insight and I can take action. And I'm going to integrate. I'm going to integrate no matter what. And it, there's this whole like no matter what, which leads to programmability. So I'd love it if, if the vendor I'm working with can provide me this integration capabilities. However, you know I have some customized needs perhaps. So if they can't, at least show me how I can do it myself using APIs. I want to no matter what. And maybe I can wait. Maybe I can't. So, but modernization is definitely happening right now, and those budgets are being approved where they where they weren't always being approved before. There's no choice. I mean, you have to continue the business and you have to invest into it. Yeah, to that point, I think one of the biggest positive things I've seen is to Fabio's point and um, just engineers now being empowered, whereas you, you're no longer having to. It's not as many hurdles to justify, um, you know, new technologies or, or just doing updates. You know, a lot of times I've seen it where it was just written off. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, we don't have to have the new shiny toy, whereas now um, leadership and boards are more open minded and more willing to, you know, hear out the engineer perspective and and encourage that innovation. So it's really fun to be an engineer right now. <laughs> it's a change in thinking, right? Innovate, innovate. Right. It's so good to see decisions, uh, decisions that were being taken months or years now being taken in days or weeks. I mean, it's fun to work in an environment that's faster than before where you can be more empowered. All right. Well, I think that's a perfect place to close on a positive note. Um, this has been a great episode of Cisco Champion Radio. If you want to learn more about hybrid work and the solutions we discussed today, check out the links in the description below. And remember, you can subscribe to Cisco Champion Radio on your favorite streaming platform and receive alerts on our latest releases. So wherever you're listening to us, make sure to click on that subscribe or follow button now. Thank you for listening in. Hope you check back in with us next week.